Okay. So maybe before starting to do any further uh, readings, uh, maybe just check and see if anybody has any questions and uh, see if that... Uh, yes, Jennifer. Um, you talked about having um, uh, lost a great deal of institutional knowledge in the forest tradition through the sort of um, indigent monk um, and not having monasteries. Do you think Ajahn Chah wanted to have that sort of institutional passed down knowledge from Ajahn Mun? And mm -hmm. is that why he had <laughs> lots of monasteries? Um, well, there's, there's, many, there's many reasons. One is, uh, <coughs> say, like the, the monasteries, uh, um, there, was a, there, was a, there was a big change taking place culturally in Thailand in the uh, late 1950s and uh, as Ajahn Chah was starting to uh, develop his own uh, monastery himself and then into the 1960s. Uh, and that's that with the, uh, the encouragement and the beginning of a cash economy, then um, within two or three decades, the vast majority of forests were actually destroyed in Thailand. It didn't take very long, um, and um, so that the the actual um, how do you say venue for these wandering um, itinerant uh, monks was pretty much gone. Um, so that that I think that plays a part, and that happened not just with Ajahn Chah, but the, uh, uh, the vast majority of other um, forest monks, what they did was start to, they see, you look around and you see, wow, it's disappearing all around us. We'd better establish something. And um, those are, that's where they, they started to settle in forests. And whether they were small or large, uh, then they were protectors of the forest. And that has carried on to today uh, and in fact has sort of escalated uh, so that there's a <coughs> an increasing in, in, um, in the beginning then there was a lot of resistance amongst the um, say the yeah, Department of Forestry. Uh, <laughs> they didn't want these monks camping out in their forest, and who are they, and what are they doing? And, uh, and, and in some, it's just sort of the, the uh, you know, it doesn't fit into the model of how they do things. In others, it was, they got in the way of the ability to make more money off merchants coming and cutting the forests, you know, so it was, there was a lot of, it, was, it happened very, very quickly. Uh, so that, uh, again, in, in Thai, in, in Thai the word for a, a wandering monk is sort of like a, a, a tudong monk. A tudong. And, and, and Ajahn Chah would play a word, and he says, nowadays there aren't any tudong monks left. There's only tulutdong monks. And tulut, Dong is the word for forest, and taluk means to pass through. So it's like, it's like, it's just all of a sudden you're, there's a forest and you're through it already. It's, there's nothing left. So a lot of the uh, 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 effort uh, that was made was, was to create places of practice that were out of the, um, out of the city, uh, and... Uh, that were quiet places. And of course, with the in incredible urbanization that's taken place in Thailand, some of the forest monasteries that were established um, are now, say there's one branch monastery of Wat Bapong that was established way on the outskirts of Bangkok. And now it's got like three ha housing estates on three sides. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's definitely lost its it's uh, its flavor. 
Yeah, so that, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's facing, the, just trying to deal with the, the changing uh, situation in the culture and the society. But now there's this great institutional knowledge, which yes. has... That's yeah. the result of that. <coughs> it's true, and there's there is a there is a uh, there is a s almost a, a, on a certain level a systematization which has benefits and drawbacks. Mm -hmm. um, so that uh, uh, you know the forest monks are learning to be a bit more uh, how to f work with the the powers that be a bit more. Whereas before they were really just off; mm -hmm. uh, they could just step out and just not be noticed. Mm. So. Yes? Uh, when the, you and other Western... When you and other... It's not on. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When you and other Western seekers went to Thailand, I was interested to know, of course, Jack and Joseph and other teachers of lay people, and then yourself and Ajahn Amaro, and maybe others in the monastic tradition. Could you say something about how the teachings are the same or different between the monastic and the lay tradition that came from Ajahn Cha, mm -hmm. and anything else you could um, help us relate as lay people to the teachings and the tradition of the monastic um, mm -hmm. establishment? Yeah. Um, yes, when re the uh, the first um, Westerner who came to stay with Ajahn Chah was Ajahn Sumedho, uh, 1967, and um, he uh, he showed up and. Um, yes, the first contact that Ajahn Chah ever had with a Westerner. Ubon was, um, prior to that, probably the only Western contact. Well, that's not true. There was, there was started to be an a American Air Force base uh, in, uh, in Ubon. Um, I think there was probably 15,000 Air Force personnel uh, <laughs> In because it was close, Ubon is it's closer. It's during the Vietnam War as it was escalating, and the uh, uh, it was closer to uh, uh, Hanoi and Saigon than it was to Bangkok uh, geographically. So it was a great place for a fighter bomber base. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was. It's one of the things I brought with me from Thailand. To a Giri is if anybody's been to a Giri, there's the bell in the central courtyard. That's a bomb casing. <laughs> Ameri good American bomb. Awesome. <laughs> so brought it for another another purpose. Well it has a clacker. Ah, you, it's got a ringer. Yeah, uh, you know we've got it. So uh, we've got it. It's it's actually because they're good metal. Uh, there's a, they're all over Thailand. <laughs> as bells, as yeah, monastery bells. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bombs to bells, yeah. Uh, so the, uh, but but the, so that was maybe the you know Ajahn Chah might have seen a bit, but he certainly somebody who showed up to train at the monastery it never happened. So. He, his, his way of, when he, when Ajahn Sumedho first came, um, one of the things that he said to Ajahn Sumedho, yeah, you can come and stay here, um, but uh, you have to live like everybody else. Um, and uh, uh, that was something that Ajahn, Ajahn Sumedho had, had been studying in Bangkok, he'd been in another place in the north of the northeast of Thailand, and he'd always got special dispensation because he was a Westerner. And uh, Ajahn Chah didn't do that. Uh, so that, uh, he said, you, you'll have to learn how to live l like everybody else here. And uh, that was uh, 
um, that was extremely useful for, for training. Um, in terms of, of uh, <coughs> you know, actual teachings, of course, there's a different flavor uh, for teaching monastics and teaching lay people. Um, and Ajahn Chah had a, a very, um, uh, you know, devoted and extensive um, base of lay people coming to the to the monastery, and uh, of course not Westerners, but uh, uh, but still there. When you're living in the monastery, you see you know, these different different uh, ways of, of emphasis and teaching. Uh, but still, his, the flavor of commitment and renunciation are there, or integrity, very strong. Ajahn Chah, his, whether it was to lay people or to monastics, um, he one of the bases of his um, teaching, the foundation, is really around virtue and right understanding. Like those are the those are the foundations that all practice has to be built up on. Uh, so that that um, you know whether one's a living in the world as a lay person or living in a monastery, uh, that's that's the found if you really want to grow in the practice in terms of meditation, in terms of wisdom, that's the base that you have to grow up from. And so that was very very, very strong. And, and I remember when I first went to um, Ajahn Chah's monastery, and uh, of course it's on a regular day, you come in, it's quite quiet, there's a few lay people around, um, and then it's the observance night a few days later on the uh, lunar quarters, and boom, there's the monastery is full of lay people, and uh, they're taking precepts. They're meditating. They're listening to dhamma talks, and and it's not just that they're meditating. I mean, they're they're really meditating, uh, and I'm sitting here squirming, and and uh, and this is this is all night, every once a week, all night session in meditation and chanting and 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 dhamma practice. Um, and and it's you know it's not like like even nowadays with Ajahn pa Ajahn Chah passed away for twenty years or almost sixteen seventeen eighteen years um, the uh, you know I'd say there's you know on an average or sit on on a regular weekly observance day there's about two hundred lay people show up and it's just they're there to practice they're they're solid. And uh, so that uh, you know, strong commitment to meditation and practice, and Ajahn Chah encouraging them, and then them taking taking up on it. And so, but I think it all comes back to that 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 emphasis that Ajahn Chah made that whatever practice you do, really get those foundations right. It's virtue and right 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 view. What would you say that the primary t primary characteristics that uh, distinguish Thai Buddhism from like Tibetan Kadampa or Japanese Zen? Um, well, I mean, to say Thai Buddhism is not is a bit of a there's a lot of lot of Buddhism in Thailand. A lot of different flavors, a lot of different expressions, a lot of different ways of practice. Uh, but in terms of, uh, say, my experience with, uh, say, Ajahn Chah's uh, training um, in the, uh, say, from the northeast of Thailand, is a one. There's an emphasis on uh, communal practice. Uh, whether it's communal practice as a monastic living in community or as a lay practitioner 
embedded in the, in the community of practitioners that you're in uh, around the monastery. So there's a sense of co communality uh, so that there's individual practice, but it's in relationship to others. So that's, that's a strong flavor. Um, I think the, the, for the, uh, uh, there's a, um, there's a very strong sense of practicality, down-to-earthness of the, uh, uh, um, say, the northeastern Thai temperament, uh, and uh, that's a flavor that it, it's really, it's not philosophical, you're not going to end up in long, uh, 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 sort of discursive projections about the ultimate reality, and, and that uh, it, it's it's more around what do you do and what's the result you d that of what you do, and does it make you feel better or not? <laughs> so there's that that kind of earthiness and and a very directness that that I really I really appreciate. Um, so that uh, you know, that's a that's a distinctive flavor, I think. Okay, okay should I go on? Mm -hmm. One more. Just, um, personally, today was my first exposure to uh, walking meditation. Uh huh. And um, so, just regarding the topic of walking meditation. There's, there's not much I know about that, and, and only maybe slightly more I know about, I guess you'd call it sitting meditation. Uh, can, can you just maybe um, spend a couple more minutes uh, talking about the mindset or, or um, maybe the movements or, okay. I guess, uh, okay. tips and tricks of the trade, kind of like, because what, what, okay. it, it, was, it was impactful. It was very impactful, and I didn't anticipate that, right, and I'd right. like to know a little bit more about what to do with it. Okay. Maybe when we begin the walking meditation, I'll give uh, I'll give a bit of bit of bit more instruction around that. Okay. I'll carry on with Ajahn Chah <laughs> before we have a, another sit. Um, so we left Ajahn Chah um, with uh, him. Uh, walking out of uh, Lumpur Man's uh, monastery after only receiving a couple uh, days of instruction. He was there for three days. And uh, that uh, um, um, in, in this uh, um, manuscript, it's, it's actually explained a bit more fully uh, one of the reasons for, for that is that in Thailand there's two major sects of, of Buddhism. And uh, uh, the, uh, there's sort of the larger and the smaller sect. And the smaller is, is uh, uh, it's a, called Dhammayut, and it's called, uh, it's probably maybe 10% of the monastic population. Uh, and uh, uh, but Ajahn Man belonged to that sect, and Ajahn Chah belonged to the Mahanikai, which is the the larger uh, grouping. And uh, it wasn't so convenient for uh, them to stay in each other's monasteries. Um, it's just the way it goes. Um, there's politics in everything. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was one of the questions that Ad, uh, Ajahn Chah asked Lumpur Man was because many, many of the uh, disciples of, of Ajahn Man in those days uh, were uh, relinquishing their ordination with the uh, Mahanikai sect and reordaining uh, to be uh, able to stay with Nupuman. And um, Ajahn Chah actually asked him, should I 
reordained to be a, a, a part of, to be able to live closer. And, uh, and he said, no. And he actually said, Mahanikai needs good monks as well. <laughs> so that uh, he could probably, you know, he's, his psychic abilities were renowned. And uh, one can only assume, uh, Ajahn Man never said anything, Ajahn Chah never said anything, so one can only assume that he probably saw that yeah, Ajahn Chah is probably going to be a, a, a teacher who's going to have some influence in the... Uh, uh, in the and there's uh, um, say so just uh, say one reason for it that has been suggested is that just just prior to Ajahn Chah's visit, one of Lumpaman's senior disciples saw Ubon split off from the rest of the northeast of Thailand. This is in a medit meditative vision. It said that Lumpaman considered this a sign that Ubon would not be a stronghold for the for the Dhammayut forest monks in the future. And he recognized in Ajahn Chah the monk who had spread the forest tradition to the Mahanikai order and build monasteries in Ubon. Mm -hmm. So, and that's very much the case nowadays. If you go out from Ubon in any direction, you're going to run into a monastery of Ajahn Chahs. And uh, so that, uh, so then he uh, studied and trained with with a couple other monks and. Uh, of the monks that Ajahn Chah looked up to and praised to his disciples, the two that took pride of place, apart from Lumpu Man, were Lumpu Tonglat and Lumpu Kinnerli. Uh, these two monks were friends. They belonged to the small fraternity of Lumpu Man's disciples who maintained their affiliation with the Mahanikai sect. Their personalities could hardly have been more different. While Lumpu Tonglat was fierce and unconventional, Lumpu Kinnerli was quiet and unobtrusive. Ajahn Chah praised Lumpu, Lumpu Tonglat's fearlessness and sense of humor. Lumpu Kinnerli's simplicity, his ability to maintain mindfulness in all postures, and his patient attention to detail. It was with Lumpu Kinnerli that Ajahn Chah had the most contact. He spent little time with Lumpu Tonglat. Indeed, no record survives of exactly when and how often they met. Although their first meeting has become legendary thanks to Lumpu Tonglat's greeting of the young monk he'd never met before with the words, So, you're Cha, are you? Ajahn Cha's relationship to Lumpu Kinnerli is clearer. It began in that hot season of 1948 and lasted until the latter's death in 1979. In the last years of Lumpu Kinnerli's life, he was cared for by monks sent from Wat Bapong by Ajahn Cha. Lumpu Kinnerli had led an eventful monastic life. After receiving teachings from Lumpu Man and Lumpu Sao, Lumpu Sao is a contemporary of Ajahn Man, was actually older and was his teacher, first meditation teacher. And then uh, it was, uh, but he wasn't, uh, say, enlightened yet. Lumpu Man came back and taught Lumpu Sao and then the teacher became enlightened after that as well. So it was. A, um, he had spent many wa years wandering on Tudong, including over ten years in Burma. He was one of only a handful of monks of his generation to have visited the Buddhist holy places in northeast India. That's walking, walking there. Yet by the time Ajahn Chah knew him, Lumpu Kinnerli did not have the air of a hard and seasoned traveler. He wore about him like an old, well-used robe a modest self-sufficiency and ease that spoke of someone with nothing more to prove to himself. He seemed content with what each moment brought him. Ajahn Chah soon found that the fact that he rarely spoke was not merely taciturnity, but rather the fruit of a sweet, gentle nature so at home in silence that he rarely saw reason to disturb it with speech. He was an industrious man who would spend his days tinkering, pottering, sewing, cleaning, all of his requisites he made himself and, and used them until they fell apart. As he got older, his appearance became even more shabby and decrepit. <laughs> but as Ajahn Chah discovered, his mind remained bright and clean. Ajahn Chah's initial visit to, to, to uh, Lumpu Kinnerli's monastery was a short one. He found Lumpu Kinnerli, Kinnerli's customarily 
elliptic and poetical advice on practice hard to understand and yet intriguing. Every now and again a blunter teaching got through. He was impressed enough to, to decide to return for the rains. And this is Ajahn Chah speaking. At that time I'd hear the teachers giving Dhamma talks about letting go, letting go, and I still couldn't really understand. Lumpo Kinnerly asked me to sew a set of robes. I went at it flat out. I wanted to get it over and done with quickly. Once the task was done, I thought I'd be free of business and able to get down to some meditation. One day Lumpo walked over. I was sewing out in the sun, totally unaware of the heat. I just wanted to get finished so that I could devote myself to meditation. He asked me, what's the hurry? I'm hurrying to get finished. When you've finished, what are you going to do? I'm going to meditate. After you've done that, what are you going to do? I'm going to do so and so. Then when you finish that, what are you going to do? I'm going to do so and so. And then what will you do? <laughs> there would be no end of this, he said. Don't you realize that it's just this sowing that is your meditation? Where are you rushing off to? You've already gone wrong. Craving is flooding through your head and you've no idea what's going on. Another shaft of life. I'd been sure I was making merit, I was doing good. I'd thought merely doing the job was good enough. I'd get it done quickly and go on to something else. But Lumpu pointed out my mistake. What was the hurry? <laughs> uh. One of the things for, uh, um, even if you're a forest monk and you're wandering, you'll almost always have one or two monks with you, or a novice, a lay person. It's very rare in Thailand to uh, to actually to be on your own. I mean, it's a uh, they're very they're very social people, and uh, and even if you're you're a monk, you'd still yeah you you would. You know, at least two or three or four. I mean, just just wandering on your own is pretty rare. Um, but uh, uh, at one point, Ajahn Chah uh, just got uh, really uh, uh, resistant to being with anybody, so he went off on a off in, to stay in a small monastery on his own completely. So they say, in the deserted monastery he dwelt in. Small signs of former inhabitants were all around him. There were discolored books behind the altar, eaten through by termites, candle wax drippings on the floor. It was a created solitude, one born of rejection, and so was sad in a way that the most remote mountaintop or cave could never be. One day, to his exasperation, Ajahn Chah began to feel lonely. I started thinking, it would be good to have a small novice or, or an anagarika to help out with a, few, with a few odd jobs around here. <laughs> but then other thoughts started to challenge that line of thought. You're really something. Only a short time ago you were fed up with your companions. So now why do you want to find some more? <laughs> and he said, yes, it's true I was fed up, but only with people who aren't good companions. <laughs> right now I need a good companion. So where are the good people? Can you search them out? You haven't been satisfied with any of your traveling companions so far. You must think you're the only good person around to have left them behind and come here alone. Ajahn Chah said that when that thought arose, he had an insight that he was to make use of from that day onwards. Where is the good person? He lies within us. If we're good, then wherever we go, the goodness stays with us. People may praise us, blame us, or treat us with contempt. But whatever they say or do, we're still good. Without goodness, our mind constantly wavers. We're angered by criticism and pleased by praise. 
Through knowing where the good person dwells, we have a principle to rely on in letting go of thought. If we go somewhere where people dislike us or say things about us, then we don't consider that, that to be because they're good or bad. We know that goodness and badness lie within us. Nobody can know us as well as we know ourselves. Okay, maybe we can take some time to sit. Some instruction from Ajahn Chah. So, you must try not to think too much. If you do think, then do so with awareness. But so far, your thinking has been done with no awareness. First, you must make your mind calm. Where there is knowing, there is no need to think. Awareness will arise in its place. And this will in turn become wisdom. But the ordinary kind of mental pro proliferation is not wisdom. It is simply the aimless and unaware wandering and thinking of the mind which inevitably results in agitation. This is not wisdom. At this stage, you don't need to think. You've already done a great deal of thinking at home, haven't you? It just stirs up the heart. You must establish some awareness. Obsessive thinking can even bring you to tears. Just try it out. Getting lost in some train of thought won't lead you to the truth. It's not wisdom. The Buddha was a very wise person. He'd learned how to stop thinking. In the same way, you are practicing here in order to stop thinking and thereby arrive at peace. There must be calm first. If there is only thinking wisdom, if there is only thinking, wisdom will not arise. There will be no awareness of the truth. All that will arise will be endless proliferation. If you are already calm, it's not necessary to think. Wisdom will arise in its place. To meditate, you do not have to think much more than to resolve that right now, is the time for training the mind and nothing else. Don't let the mind shoot off to the left or the, to the right, to the front or behind, above or below. Our only duty right now is to practice mindfulness of the breathing. Fix your attention at the head and move it down through the body to the tips of the feet and then back up to the crown of the head. Pass your awareness down through the body, observing with wisdom. We do this to gain an initial understanding of the way the body is. Then begin the meditation, noting that at this time your sole duty to is, a, is to observe the inhalations and exhalations. Don't force the breath to be any longer and shorter than normal. Just allow it to continue easily. Don't put any pressure on the breath. Rather, let it flow evenly. 
letting go with each in-breath and out-breath. You must understand that you are letting go as you do this, but there should still be awareness. You must maintain this awareness, allowing the breath to enter and leave comfortably. There's no need to force the breath. Just allow it to flow easily and naturally. Maintain the resolve that at this time you have no other duties or responsibilities. Thoughts about what will happen, what you will know or see during the sitting, may arise from time to time. But once they arise, just let them cease by themselves. Don't be concerned over them. During the meditation, there is no need to pay attention to sense impressions. Whenever the mind is affected by sense impingement, wherever, wherever there is a feeling or sensation in the mind, just let it go. Whether those sensations are good or bad is unimportant. It is not necessary to make anything out of those sensations. Just let them pass away and return your attention to the breath. Maintain the awareness of the breath entering and leaving. Don't create suffering over the breath being too long or too short. Simply observe it without trying to control or suppress it in any way. In other words, don't attach. Allow the breath to continue as it is, and the mind will become calm. As you continue, the mind will gradually lay things down and come to rest, the breath becoming lighter and lighter, until it becomes so faint that it seems like it's not there at all. Both the body and the mind will feel light and energized. All that will remain will be a one-pointed knowing. You could say that the mind has changed and reached a state of calm. If the mind becomes agitated, set up mindfulness and inhale deeply till there is no space left to store any air. Then release it all completely until none remains. Follow this with another deep inhalation until you are full. Then release the air again. Do this two or three times. Then re-establish concentration. The mind should be calmer. If any more sense impressions cause as agitation in the mind, repeat, repeat the process on every occasion. Similarly with walking meditation. If, while walking, the mind becomes agitated, then stop still. Calm the mind, re-establish the awareness with the meditation object, and then continue walking. Sitting and walking meditation are in essence the same, differing only in terms of the physical posture used. Sometimes there may be doubt, so you must have mindfulness to be the one who knows, continually following and examining the agitated mind in whatever form it takes. This is to have mindfulness. Mindfulness watches over and takes care of the mind. You must maintain this knowing and not be careless or wander astray, no matter what condition the mind take, takes on. The trick is to have mindfulness taking control and supervising the mind. Once the mind is unified with mindfulness, a new kind of awareness will emerge. The mind that has developed cal calm is held in check by that calm, just like a chicken held in a coop. The chicken is unable to wander outside, but it can still move around within the coop. It's walking to and fro doesn't get it into trouble because it is restrained by the coop. Likewise, the awareness that takes place when the mind has mindfulness 
and is calm does not cause trouble. None of the thinking or sensations that take place within the calm mind cause harm or disturbance. Some people don't want to experience any thoughts or feelings at all, but this is going too far. Feelings arise within the state of calm. The mind is both experiencing feelings and calm at the same time, without being disturbed. When there is calm like this, there are no harmful consequences. Problems occur when the chicken gets out of the coop. For instance, you may be watching the breath entering and leaving and then forget yourself, allowing the mind to wander away from the breath, back home, off to the shops, or to any number of different places. Maybe even half an hour may pass before you suddenly realize you're supposed to be practicing meditation and reprimand yourself for your lack of mindfulness. This is where you have to be really careful because this is where the chicken gets out of the coop. The mind leaves its base of calm. You must take care to maintain the awareness with mindfulness and try to pull the mind back. Although I use the words, pull the mind back, in fact, the mind doesn't really go anywhere. Only the object of awareness has changed. You must make the mind stay right here and now. As long as there is mindfulness, there will be presence of mind. It seems like you are pulling the mind back, but really it hasn't gone anywhere it has simply changed a little. It seems that the mind goes here and there, but in fact, the change occurs right at, that, at the one spot. When mindfulness is regained, in a flash you are back with the mind without it having to be brought from anywhere. When there is total knowing, a continuous and unbroken awareness at each and every moment, this is called presence of mind. If your attention drifts from the breath to other places, then the knowing is broken. Whenever there is awareness of the breath, the mind is there. With just the breath and this even and continuous awareness, you have presence of mind. There must be both mindfulness and clear comprehension. Mindfulness is recollection, and clear comprehension is self-awareness. Right now you are clearly aware of the breath. This exercise of, of watching the breath helps mindfulness and clear comprehension develop together. They share the work. Having both mindfulness and clear comprehension is like having two workers to lift a heavy plank of wood. Suppose there are two people trying to lift some heavy planks, but the weight is so great, they have to strain so hard that it's almost unendurable. Then another person, imbued with goodwill, sees them and rushes in to help. In the same way, when there is mindfulness and clear comprehension, then wisdom will arise at the same place to help out. Then all three of them support each other. With wisdom there will be an understanding of sense objects. For instance, during the meditation sense objects are experienced which give rise to feelings and moods. You may start to think of a friend, but then wisdom should immediately counter with, it doesn't matter, stop, or Forget it. Or if there are thoughts about where you will go tomorrow, then the response should be, I'm not interested. I don't want to concern myself with such things. Maybe you start thinking about other people. Then you should think, No, I don't want to get involved. Just let go. Or, 
It's all uncertain and never a sure thing. This is how you should deal with things in meditation, recognizing them as not sure, not sure, and maintaining this kind of awareness. Don't get caught up in these things during the meditation. In the end, all that will remain in the mind in its purest form are mindfulness, clear comprehension, and wisdom. Whenever these things weaken, doubts will arise. But try to abandon those doubts immediately, leaving only mindfulness, clear comprehension, and wisdom. Try to develop mindfulness like this until it can be maintained at all times. Then you will understand mindfulness, clear comprehension, and wisdom thoroughly. Whether you are attracted to or repelled by external sense objects, you will be able to tell yourself it's not sure. Either way, are just hindrances to be swept away till the mind is clean. All that should remain is mindfulness, clear comprehension, the firm and unwavering mind, and consummate wisdom. For the time being, I will say just this much on the subject of meditation.
we could take the opportunity to do some <coughs> walking meditation. And the uh, in walking meditation, uh, it's helpful to recognize that basically all one's doing is taking, in the same way that when you attend to the sensation of the breath, uh, in breathing, mindfulness of the breath, then you're taking, say, the rhythm of the sensation of the body as it's walking. And just, say, paying attention to the sensation of the, the feet touching the, the ground or the floor, wherever you're, you're, you're walking, and bringing attention down into the, into the soles of the feet into the movement of the, say, the lifting of the foot, moving of the foot, setting it down, lifting of the foot, moving of the foot, setting it down, lifting of the foot, moving of the foot, setting it down, like bringing awareness down into the sensation of the body. The uh, uh, One of the great advantages of bringing the attention uh, down into the body and particularly down into the feet, that it's about as far away as possible from where your thinking goes on. And, and that's helpful because um, it just is, uh, um, it doesn't take much of a, of a encouragement for the mind to start running around after various thoughts, impressions, feelings, that arise in the mind. So, just using, using the, bo the sensations of the body skillfully. One of the, say, the great benefits of using the body as a focus of attention is, the, uh, is that the uh, um, even if the mind is running off to the future or the past or proliferating about something or other, the body is always in the present moment. And you can come back to that. And as soon as you anchor your awareness in that sensation, that very simple sensation, just the foot rising, moving, setting down, lifting, moving, setting down, you're back into the, into the present moment. And, of course, that's very helpful. Um, that uh, gives an opportunity to, it gives an opening to be able to let go of the proliferations of the, of the mind. And, and as Ajahn Chah said in that, in that last reading, um, it's not that there isn't any thoughts or feelings at all, but it's what happens there's a different quality when they arise within a sphere of calmness. When there's mindfulness and attention and a, a, a calm awareness, then even if something arises, it's not, a, you know, it's not a problem. It's just what the mind does. The minds are, I mean, they're hardwired to think and feel. And if we make a problem out of it, then we suffer. But it's so that it's just recognize, oh, that's another thought. Okay, back to the attention, back to the awareness. Uh, and, and very steadily and gently sustaining that, that quality of awareness. And the walking meditation is very helpful in doing that in the sense that there's a... Uh, there's a certain relaxation that just walking. Uh, there's a rhythm, a touching of the earth that is is uh, uh, is one wonderfully settling. Uh, so that to uh, yeah, just to give yourself the opportunity to experience that and experiment with okay, how to relax, how to sustain attention, how to let go how to rein the mind in. There's, there's this 
uh, experimenting that we have to learn how to do, finding a balance of, say, like of settling the mind, but then also not forcing the mind, of training the mind, but also giving the mind some space. So those, that's an ongoing conundrum. And the, the walking meditation is a good opportunity to explore that. So it gives you... So we'll come back again for another sitting about 3.15.